think we there's a lot of stigma still attached to drug and alcohol use um and we sort of we want to label people alcoholics because they're the they're the really bad people right they're the people who are in a really bad way and they're waking up and drinking vodka for breakfast and they're sneaking you know wine into work or whatever it might be and it, when we do that that kind of othering it sort of separates us from a problem that is everyone's problem because yeah. you know everyone and i think that's the insidious thing about alcohol compared to any other drug I mean, we know that it causes more damage than any other drug that's right uh, it's legal it's not only socially accepted it's socially expected you know and i think <laughs> that, that 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 is to me the challenge is that people don't want to they they see they see um alcoholism or problematic alcohol use as a moral failing mm. and i just think that as just such if you read um holly whitaker's quit like a woman where she talks about this is actually the culture that is set up for us to fail like we we we, we take this highly addictive drug and it's the only drug where we have to explain to people why we're not taking it <laughs> <You know? laughs> when we when we stopped smoking or i'm sure when you stopped using drugs people were like oh congratulations good on you that's awesome when we stop drinking we are asked the question what's wrong with you like why wh why we, pe we people see you as not trustworthy so i think yeah. there's something really shifting around that that i've noticed in the last few years that wasn't there even 10 years ago when i wrote high sobriety like the, the culture now around the sober curious movement and the, the conversations that we're starting to have to have around the way that we use alcohol in our community i think it's really has really changed quite significantly boom welcome back everybody to another episode of real drug talk now um pretty cool today has just been an awesome day for me um because as i've mentioned probably on the last couple of podcasts that have come out uh anytime now uh, my uh first little bubba is coming um so we're trying to put together a whole bunch of episodes so that there's content over the time when i take some time off um and it's been a good day because i've just done like so many episodes all at once and there's actually been some really awesome guests and our and our guest on today's show, uh, I've been wanting to actually talk to for ages because I've followed her on social media um, and something that I'm really passionate about and been talking to a lot of people for a long time is changes to how we think about alcohol consumption and, and the role of it in our culture and, and all that sort of stuff. And this person is on the front lines and the front foot of that and is kind of doing some cool stuff through social media and stuff. So, hey, go on, Jill. <laughs> Pretty good. Thanks for the intro. No worries. No worries. Um, so do you want to give us the, um, the, the quick three minute snapshot? That's what we'll start with. And then we can kind of spark it on there. Like how, what's your story? Obviously this is real drug talk. We talk about drugs and alcohol, everything to do with it. How do you fit into the picture of this show? Um, yeah. Do you want to give me the, the three minute snapshot about you and, and how you found yourself in this space doing these things? Three minutes for the last 40 plus years. I'll give it <laughs> That's um, right. Elevator pitch. Yeah. So I grew up in Scotland where I was born. Um, nice. A very big drinking culture over there. Uh, I had my first drink at the age of 13, a kind of lager, which I drank with a straw and put, put it, laced it with sugar because I was told that that would get us drunk faster and make the taste wow. a little bit revolting. Um, yeah. And I was just your average binge drinking teenager and then a binge drinking 20 something and then a 30 something and um <laughs> also a, a journalist so a very big drinking culture in that industry wow. um and uh, yeah i i ironically was a health reporter for the age newspaper in melbourne and <laughs> I, uh, I was writing you know the the, the tagline for my book was, you know, during the week I wrote about Australia's alcohol culture and at the weekends I wrote myself off and uh, <laughs> that was very much my life. I was winning awards for um, writing about Australia's binge drinking 
crisis and all the social and health and economic problems that flew, uh, that flowed from that. But I didn't really quite like connect the dots that I was kind of part of that culture and part of the problem because I kind of just slipped seamlessly into the social norm because everyone was drinking the same. It wasn't like not at my friends were doing anything different. So I was just getting hammered every weekend and often quite a couple of times during the week as well after work. Um, and then it got to uh, New Year's Day 2011. Um, you know, that was the year I was about to turn 35 and I woke up with a hangover. I mean, I'd only, I think I woke up at like two o'clock in the afternoon. I got home at six o'clock in the morning and I had a hangover that was so violent. I thought it was going to kill me. Like I just, wow. you know, I felt, I got in my car to drive to McDonald's, to drive to McDonald's, you know, as you do, and yeah. um, had a pretty intense panic attack, had to pull the car over to the side of the road. And I got home and I was sort of sitting there, you know, wrapped in shame and eating my like sad uh, Big Mac. And <laughs> like, I can't continue to do this. I've been doing this for 20 something years at that point. Yeah. Um, and I, a few months before that, I had met Chris Rain who founded Hello Sunday Morning. And yeah. I wrote a story about him and that, that back in then in 2010 like that was literally just a blog with about 50 people on it it was a very it wasn't you know a, an organization really at that point but um he was trying to grow it into this movement and he'd said to me oh why don't you give um sobriety a crack and I just laughed at him and I was like you know as if I could do that I'm a journalist and I'm Scottish and I'm all of these things that we tell ourselves you know the reasons we drink um uh, but it, something about meeting him and what he was trying to do uh really stayed with me and he'd always said like the 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 minimum amount of time you need to, to to quit drinking to really change the habit and to really examine the reasons why you drink is three months so you know we might just white knuckle it for feb fast or dry july but we don't really get to know ourselves very well so he said three months i woke up on that new year's day thinking three months oh that's petrifying and the thought scared me so much that i realized then i had to do it because if the thought of not drinking alcohol for 90 days feels like social suicide then I really need to examine the role of alcohol in my life so wow. I decided I, I quit drinking for what was meant to be three months at the end of the three months I decided I was enjoying it so much I was getting so much out of it that I would do another three months and at the beginning at the end of that first three month period I wrote a piece for the Sunday age about 2000 words where I it basically started just as I said you know during the week I write about Australia's booze soap culture and at the weekends I write myself off and I just it was this confessional about what I'd learned about myself as a drinker and as somebody who stopped drinking for a few months what I learned about the culture and it just uh, of all the things I've written in my career at that point it had the biggest impact of anything I'd ever written there was just this, we were inundated with people saying this is my story because wow you know, like people weren't really talking about this sort of stuff 10 years ago. Um, and it led to a book deal. So a couple of publishers came forward and said, we'd like to meet with you. And, I, you know, I'd always wanted to write a book. I never thought for a second it would be about sobriety. <laughs> Third, but um, I was approached by a publisher who said, you know, if you write, if you um, were to do this for a year, take a whole year off the booze there's a book in that and I was like really and so they offered me a book deal on the spot I walked out of the publisher's office you know into the sunshine just thinking this is a dream come true and, and thinking I just want to go to the pub to celebrate but I couldn't for another nine months because I just agreed to not drink and I was about to sign a contract to say I would write a book about it so yeah wow. that was my that was my first initiation into sobriety. I then wrote a book called High Sobriety, uh, which came out in 2013. And to my great surprise, it was a bestseller. It's still selling now, eight years later. Wow. Um, and, you know, I uh, I think a lot of people were a bit disappointed at the end of the um, of that period, I went back to drinking. But for quite a few years, I was very moderate drinker. I was a much more mindful drinker there was many more occasions where I would choose not to have a drink and I was no longer kind of using alcohol to manage my stress but then over the years old habits began to creep in and um it, what happened at the end of sort of 2014 into 2015 when my book became a bestseller and everything in my life was on paper perfect hunky right? dory yeah I had, I had it all like i had this written a book that everyone was buying i had a dream job 
I bought my own home. I was dating an AFL player, which in hindsight is not the recipe for happiness. Definitely don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I had all of these things. And then I had a quite serious uh, breakdown, which my psychologist would later rebrand as a breakthrough because it is often um, yeah, the yeah. Kind of diversity that we find out the most about ourselves. But um, in rebuilding myself from the ashes of that kind of breakdown, breakthrough, um, I wrote, the book happy never after which describes how you know like we're this constant pursuit of um happiness is actually making us miserable and all of these external things that we think will make us happy are actually just red herrings and alcohol is one of those things i think that we we tend to reach for um to try and numb feelings that we have been told by our culture are abnormal you know like just yeah and loss and grief and frustration and sadness disappointment and those things are actually all part of the human condition um yeah so and in yeah in the last few years i could no longer i, I kind of built myself back and like put the broken pieces of myself back together and emerged you know stronger than ever from that period um but what I noticed was I could no longer ignore the correlation between the huge dip in my mood and these big nights out of drinking that I was having. And I was yeah. coming back to where I was 10 years ago. So I decided in after um, a very raucous party at my house, which I don't remember after about nine o'clock at night, <laughs> apparently it was a really but I don't remember it. My friend said it was a really fun time. Um, that was June 20, 2019. And I was like, oh, I just need to quit drinking because I think I'm going to be a better version of myself without it. And I think my mental health will um, will be better for it. And it has been, other than therapy, the most effective thing I've done for my mental health as, as someone who's you know struggled with anxiety and depression since I was a teenager. So I don't know if that's probably a bit more than three minutes, but that's where... That's Love where it. I am now. And yeah, so it's been nearly two years. And um, recently I started doing uh, on my Instagram. It was every week, but now I've done it. I'm doing it every first Tuesday of the month. It's a thing I call No Booze Day Tuesday, where nice. I invite people um, to, who are sober curious or who are already sober, who are just thinking about their relationship with alcohol. I invite them to come on and ask me questions about my experience of sobriety and what I've learned. And it's become this really um, amazing community of people who are just really curious and who are really supportive. And sometimes I have guests on to talk about um, areas that might not be uh, my area of expertise. So I've had yeah. um, someone was on talking about sober dating. I've got someone coming on soon talking about um, uh, sober, uh, sorry, the mummy wine culture, you know, where a lot of yeah. mums feel like they're kind of pressured to drink a lot. So yeah, that's been, that's been a really fun thing that I've uh, introduced in the last year or so. Amazing. Hey, and I can tell why um, the books have been bestsellers because the way that you articulate the internal process, which is quite hard, or I find it quite hard of like, you know, sobriety and, and making changes and all that sort of stuff is, is spot on. Um, and I relate to it a lot. So I, I'm interested to know, cause I, I think um, it's the thing that I found really cool for, from, watching your stuff on Instagram and the messages that you're putting out around sobriety is that it's kind of like up to date <laughs> for a lack of a better term and, and kind of connects with, I think where the world's at. Um, so, and just quickly for a bit of context and people listening, like it was still great. The help that I got um, when I was going through, you know, I guess similar kind of stuff, but I was 21 at the time. Um, and, and, yeah, like I just kind of struggled with like the delivery and the information and it was all really sort of like old and, and archaic or that's what it kind of felt like to me. Um, and that was in 2011 as well, actually. So um, like, would you say that you've gone through like a traditional path of sobriety? Like, did you ever, I hope you don't mind me asking, did you ever go to things like, you know, 12 step programs or, or any like sort of impatient treatment programs or did you do a lot of your change making through yeah therapy and things like um uh uh hello sunday morning and stuff like that yeah so i mean i'm not a big fan of labels and i often get asked in Nobu's oh, Tuesday, tuesday you know do you need to be an alcoholic to stop drinking yeah you know, like, what, what, how do you see yourself now i i don't label myself as an alcoholic but i also don't i don't think labels are particularly helpful for anyone really um but if mm. that if it if it's if it's something that um, 
you find helpful, then obviously I would not criticize anyone for calling them whatever, calling themselves whatever they want. But for me, yeah. um, I, I would, you know, if, if we're going to put a label on it, I would say I was just your kind of pretty common weekend binge drinker, you know, mm-hmm. and um, I was able to stop just overnight. And I, something I always say when I'm talking to to my audience is that, you know, um, depending on how much you have been drinking, like stopping overnight might actually be quite a risky thing to do. And so it's something you should probably talk to your doctor about and think about what, what your level of consumption is. But for me, I just stopped. Um, and I didn't, I didn't go to any treatment as such like that. I, I did sign up to Hello Sunday Morning and I found that community to be really helpful. Now they've come a long way in 10 years. Like at the time it was just, I basically just wrote a blog yep, on yep. their website and looked at other people's blogs and we in the comments sections kind of supported each other but now they've got this really interactive kind of website they've got um, a daybreak app which is yep. actually got clinical supervision um, built into the model so there's a lot more um there's a lot more options out there i think that you can you can go to without necessarily having to go into a traditional aa program or a clinical setting um so no, i didn't i didn't go down that path um but i and one thing i would say is i think people often ask ask that question like how much were you drinking and did you reach rock bottom like people want to ask that question because they want to measure themselves against what you were right and so they want to know well how bad is my drinking and so what i would say to that is and it's something that that Millie Millie Gooch, who runs Sober uh, Girl Society in the UK, um, she talks about in her book that if your house is on fire, you wait for it to burn to the ground <laughs> to call the fire brigade. You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I think I think that that is the case. Like you don't need to be like rock bottom. You need to look at what impact is your drinking having on your life. Is it? Yeah. Is it taking you away from the life that you want? And that's what I found that I was starting to, the consequences for my health. Like, as I said, the last time I got drunk, I don't really remember it. And blackouts are particularly bad for your brain and yeah. they get worse the older you get. You know, that's, that's, there's something really quite toxic happening to your brain if you literally can't remember what's going on. Um, I was, you know, when, when I was drunk, all the emotional issues that I hadn't dealt with would come out to the point where, you know, and you, and you can't rein in those emotional issues when you're drunk because you don't have any impulse control or, or, or the ability to be rational. So mm. I'd wake up the next morning and realize that I'd had a massive fight with my best friend at four in the morning when I've just been abusing him because I thought he was ignoring me or whatever nonsense my brain was telling me at the time. So I, I felt like there was going to be things and, and there have there have been at least there was at least one friendship that I cannot mend from yeah. something I did when I was drunk. And I could see the trajectory that I was going on, that these decisions that I was making and often not making them rationally or consciously because I was very drunk were things that I wasn't going to be able to take back. I wasn't going to be able to fix and you know, I, I was having this conversation with a friend at dinner last night. Um, a lot of people who are, were in my situation who might just be like, might see themselves as just like the party girl who, who whose identity is kind of tied up in that drinking culture where you're the first on the dance floor and the last to leave the party. And that's just yeah. who you are. And often those people like me will have a series of things that happen that they just ignore. Like I've got a permanent scar on my knee from falling out of an Uber with some guy that I picked up at a bar and I don't even remember. Like, yeah. you know, hilarious story to tell my friends the next day, but I've literally got a permanent reminder of that on my body. And you just think like, yeah, where does that go? Eventually you might end up in a situation far more serious than that. So that's always when people ask like, oh, well, how bad did your drinking have to be before you stop? I'd say, if you're at the point where you are not injuring yourself or harming your friendships and relationships, then stop now before yeah. you get to that point. Yeah, a hundred percent. No, and again, that's I'm with I'm with you three hundred percent on on all of that stuff and the labels and and yeah, it's been it's been interesting over my journey how my thinking has kind of changed around that stuff, meeting different people. 
Um, and again, I, I think it's something really cool about like the messages that you're putting out there um, through your books and your social media is, is just actually maturing the conversation on kind of like a societal level um, so that, yeah, the, the paradigm or the perception around alcohol consumption is, is different altogether. Um, and, I, and I don't know if you know it, but it always sticks with me that that thing um, that um, Shanna Wan from Sober in the Country says is, you know, like instead of pulling people out of the river when they're drowning, going upstream and, and stopping them sort of jump in, jump in or catch them before they're drowning and stuff like that. It's, it's a, yeah. it's such an important concept. Yeah. And I think we, there's a lot of stigma still attached to drug and alcohol use. Um, and we sort of, we want to label people alcoholics because they're the, they're the really bad people, right? They're the people who are in a really bad way and they're waking up and drinking vodka for breakfast and they're sneaking, you know, wine into work or whatever it might be. And it, when we do that, that kind of othering, it sort of separates us from a problem that is everyone's problem. Because, yeah. you know, everyone, and I think that's the insidious thing about alcohol compared to any other drug even we know that it causes more damage than any other drug that's right uh, it's legal it's not only socially accepted it's socially expected you know and i think that <laughs> that, that that is to me the challenge is that people don't want to they they see they see um alcoholism or problematic alcohol use as a moral failing Mm. And I just think that as just such, if you read um, Holly Whitaker's Quit Like a Woman, where she talks about this is actually the culture that is set up for us to fail. Like we, 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 we take this highly addictive drug and it's the only drug where we have to explain to people why we're not taking it. <laughs> <laughs> when we when we stopped smoking or i'm sure when you stopped using drugs people were like oh congratulations good on you that's awesome when we stopped drinking we are asked the question what's wrong with you like why wh why we, pe we people see you as not trustworthy so i think yeah. there's something really shifting around that that i've noticed in the last few years that wasn't there even 10 years ago when i wrote high sobriety like the, the culture now around the sober curious movement and the, the conversations that we're starting to have to have around the way that we use alcohol in our community i think it's really has really changed quite significantly 100 percent, i agree with you so i try not to be an eeyore that's always looking in the sky looking at the doom and gloom because I, I think um when you're involved in these kind of spaces you it can get a bit like that sometimes, or it can for me anyway. Um, but I actually really agree with you. I, I think particularly around alcohol, which has been really cool. Um, I think it's coincided a little bit with like the wellness movement or something like that. Um, yeah, the, the still a long way to go. Don't get me wrong, but the perceptions are, are starting to shift a little bit, which is really cool. So um, the other, the other thing I was going to ask you is like, can you explain for people that haven't heard, like, what's this sober curious definition? Um, like, what does that mean? I love it. I love it. I'm like, I'm the last person to ask about that because I don't really know. I didn't, <laughs> I honestly didn't really, I haven't read. It. So it comes, I think from a book by, I think her name is Ruby Warrington. And I think she wrote a book called sober curious. Um, but I didn't know what that concept meant, right? Because when I, as I said, when I wrote High Sobriety, there wasn't a whole genre of quit lit like there is now out yeah. there. Um, I just wrote about my experiences and it wasn't part of a like wider canon of kind of literature that was out there. Um, yeah. But two years ago, just before the pandemic hit, it was the last time I was on a plane actually, which is March of last year, beginning of March last year, I was invited to go to the City Opera House to speak at the All About Women Festival. Awesome. Um, on a panel, about sober curiosity and I had and then like it was sponsored by the Sydney Morning Herald so Sydney Morning Herald sent a photographer around to my house <laughs> to and, and to interview me and a, and a journalist to interview me about sober sober curious movement I was like I don't know what that is like I get I guess <laughs> is that I don't I, but what I think it is I think it's pretty clever marketing that is actually quite effective because I think for the Brilliant, reasons I was outlining it? before yeah, people don't want to view themselves don't want to say i'm sober or i'm abstinent because that implies 
you must have a problem that you've had to go completely sober. You know, yeah. like that's, that's that's the way our culture views sobriety in in many ways still. Um, I think it's changing slowly, but I think sober curious suggests, oh, I'm just dipping my toe in the water. You know, I'm just I'm just visiting here. To it's a health. See- it's a health choice. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, I think, and I do. I think the wellness movement, which I have huge problems with, because for many reasons, but I, I do think that that's kind of, it, it, it's kind of co-opted a little bit by that movement, where so, sober curious is something um, to improve your health, and I, I think that is. I think for a lot of people, they are much more conscious about what they're putting in their bodies, or seeing more people, you know become vegan we're seeing more people think about sustainable clothing and what they put on what what they wear um so i think like when you think about alcohol you're essentially putting the same substance that you put in your car Mm, mm, (laughs) mm. um so i think there's a bit of people there's a health movement behind it but i think there's also a growing certainly for me there's a growing kind of sense of people wanting to know more about themselves and to want um to have a better understanding of who they are underneath all these layers of conditioning and pressure and social expectation and when you when you stop drinking you really get to see yourself in full clarity which can be really confronting Mm. But it's also hugely rewarding. So I think there's a, a big kind of self-improvement, sort of self-care, if that's the right word, like self-reflective kind of um, movement as well, where people are realizing that when you take alcohol out of the equation, it allows you to do that kind of deep dive into your own issues in a way that you might not have been able to do when you're clouding it with a substance that sort of isn't allowing you to be the best version of yourself. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, um, you might've said before and, and sorry if I, I missed it. So, um, at, at the moment, like at the moment, are you doing full, if we're talking about sober curious, are you doing full, full curiosity and completely sober at the moment and have been for some time or are you, you're kind of drinking off and on again? Like where, where are you at with it all at the moment? No, I, I haven't had a drink since that party in 20, 20- 19 so 28th of june so a week a week today a week today yeah will be um my two-year anniversary nice not having a drink and like it wasn't something that i i didn't say that's it i'm never drinking again and i I and I i don't say that like for some people that's that works well for them for me i just don't i don't know if that's helpful but i i honestly can't see what would change in my life that i would think that Mm-hmm. having a drink would be something that would would work for me um as i said i, I feel like it's it's been hard a lot of times but it's been so rewarding and the rewards are far outweighing the downsides and i think um i had a friend of mine say to me recently which was such a compliment and really really struck quite deeply with me she said you know and all the time i've known you i've never i've never seen you with such a strong sense of self She's like you yeah. really know you really know who you are and you're un- unapologetic about it and you are comfortable in your own skin and i was just like wow that's that's kind of come about through mm. not just sobriety but you know i've been doing therapy with a very good psychologist for many years now mm. and um there's a great piece of artwork by an artist who is himself now sober, um, Samuel Leighton Dorr, which you should check him out on Instagram. He's amazing. Um, and he talks about, he has this little um, piece of artwork where it's a little submarine and the submarine is kind of looking at an iceberg. And he says, you know, the sub, there's some like sobriety, if, if the submarine is therapy, you know, cause you're deep diving into yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Sobriety is in the little window in the submarine and you've just, unfogged it and also, <laughs> you, know, you can see yourself so much more clearly and I think that's for me that's great the greatest gift is that I was already doing great things in in therapy and trying to you know rewire my brain and undo habits that have pathways in the brain that have built up over many decades and when you stop drinking it just makes that process so much easier and 
you feel things more deeply and the lessons you learn are I think more profound in some ways because you just there's nowhere to go when you're not drinking there's nowhere to hide there's nowhere to you can't numb your discomfort or run from your issues you got to see it in like startling clarity and as I said that can be confronting at times but I think I've felt more joy in the last two years than I have in a long time as well yeah yeah that's that's Awesome. And, and again, you, you do, you, you articulate it so well. And I love this. I love the submarine story. It's a, it's a very true metaphor or um, anecdote of what happened. So, um, so would you say, so I know you don't like labels. I'll, I'll take that point. Um, uh, but would you say just for kind of our audience, would you say that you had an addiction with alcohol? Like, would you describe it like that? Or do you describe it as something, something else? Like, cause you sort of mentioned that it was on a binge format, but would you still consider that like an, or maybe not an addiction, but like an addictive pattern that you had or yeah. Well, I, mean, I think, I think we're all on the continuum of addiction, right? Because yeah. alcohol is a highly addictive subject and a substance and the way that it works on your brain. Mm regardless of who you are it, it makes you want more you know and I think there's very few people that I know who just stop at one drink very few people yeah and, and most of them wouldn't say that they're addicted but you go out for a glass of wine and then, oh just one more just one more just one more like that's the yeah. nature of, of the drug itself um I don't I don't think I was addicted in as much as you know I was thinking about alcohol all the time but but I was socially addicted in yeah. in a way that I just I couldn't fathom how I would function in social situations without a drink in my hand it just mm. didn't make any sense to me um but in terms of was I addicted to the point where I was experiencing any kind of withdrawal when I stopped drinking no not to that extent but um as I said I think that I think we're all a slave to alcohol when we do drink mm. um, and I think we as I said before we we want to we want to put ourselves on that continuum and, and we want to always find someone around us who's drinking more so we can say, Oh, I don't have a problem. And I think yeah. that was one of the things that I found really interesting when I quit 10 years ago was um, I was one of the, the bigger drinkers in the group, you know, mm. um, but I wasn't the biggest drinker in the group. But when I dropped out of that, the people around me, then stepped up to be you know they, they 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 could then not look at me anymore to say well she's drinking more so it's sort of like sobriety really it holds up a mirror to people and they find it quite confronting and I think the people who because I'm often asked on no booth day Tuesday like what do I do my friends are pressuring me to drink and I always mm -hmm. say look it's 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 kind of tough love to say it but I don't think they're really your friends I was gonna say get some new friends yeah. <laughs> yeah. they're drinking buddies and they're like the friends that I have now most of them still drink not not one of them has pressured me to drink not one of them has said I'm boring or you know they've not stopped stopped inviting me to places because I don't drink whereas the friends I had back then I realized pretty quickly oh these there is no substance to this relationship. Um, and mm. well, there is a substance, it's alcohol, but there's no, there's no depth. There's no, there's not the only thing holding the relationship together was alcohol. And for, yeah, when people say, well, what do I say when I'm not drinking? How do I justify myself? <laughs> I say, you don't have to, you shouldn't have to explain yourself to anyone. But secondly, that it's it's generally true that the people who have the biggest issue with your sobriety are the people who have unexamined issues with their own drinking that they're not prepared to look at. So it's easier mm. for them to kind of um, pass judgment on you or um, question you for your own choices. So yeah, I think the defensiveness that you get from people is almost never about you and almost uh about them. 100%. Yeah, I, I think um, I posted it or I was talking to someone about it. But um, yeah, other people always have a problem with me not drinking more than I have a problem with it, you know, or not a problem, but they're more uncomfortable they're about it. Or they just want to, yeah, I mean, the, I think there's a difference between people being curious and asking questions. Of course. 
and I guess what I would say, I always think with the people who are defensive or who are judging you, like I would always say, you know, it does it, it, it seems like they're not really your friends. But before you go to that level, I would sort of yeah. always try and give them the benefit of the doubt first. Of course. Maybe yeah. approach it with compassion and curiosity and say, look, I've noticed you've been saying a few things about my sobriety. Is there is there a reason why it troubles you so much? Like I really put it back on them to, to and, and and come at it from a position of of care and friendship rather than criticism and then if they still and, and if you and oh, the other thing i would suggest as well is to explain to them why you're not drinking because most people's yep. story is well i'm not drinking because it's this the best decision for me for whatever reason it might be yeah for me it's you know a mental health for many reasons but the, the the main one was for mental health reasons so if you explain that to the people in your life and then they still have a problem or still pressure you, then that they're just a dickhead, right? <laughs> but right. Yeah. Like if you give them the if you give them the opportunity to to understand and explain it to them and and talk them through why you're doing it, and then also ask them questions about what why they have an issue with it, and they still persist, then I think you can safely say that's more about them than it is about you. Yeah, I think um it's it's interesting, like. I agree. Like it's, it's all cool for people to be like curious and stuff, but I often have, like, I'm almost at the point of just saying like, none of your fucking business. But yeah. like, if we, if we go out and we meet like new people and stuff, like often, which, which kind of, I guess is my story. I had issues with substances and whatever, but um, yeah, you're having dinner, everyone orders a drink and I order a, lemon lime bitters or a sparkling water or something i don't know and then yeah someone will ask me like oh how come you don't drink it's it's like i know it's probably not going to happen for a long time if you're realistic because that's in the fabric of our society but i just i just it shouldn't be even like a question it's like if you go out for dinner and everyone's drinking a coca-cola and you get a water like people aren't going to ask you like oh why aren't you having a coke it's just like you're not having a coke like it does, they don't even think twice but when it's alcohol it like registers this like response from people and <laughs> it's just like crazy you know yeah well i think like one of the things i talk about in high sobriety is that the one of the reasons that i observed was just my my sort of take on it of why people react that way is that when we drink together it's sort of like a social contract that we will yeah. we will let down our inhibitions we will be a bit loose um and i think when one of you chooses not to do that if the other person is not as comfortable socially um and they feel like that you've kind of got the upper hand almost that you're you're yeah. in control while they're not and that's for me i've had to have have some with the people that matter in my life who i can see are uncomfortable and i want to make them feel comfortable i wouldn't do that just to random strangers who are behaving obnoxiously but yeah for people who i can see are struggling i'll be like explain to them that i am not going to be judging you for how drunk you get or what you know what you say or anything like that like it's it's just but it is it's a it's a it's a strange situation i think it's it's easier in a group if the the there's more of them having a drink but if it's just one on one and one person's drinking the other one isn't i know that some people can find that difficult after a few wines because then they're like oh i feel a bit altered and yeah. you are not and they feel a bit exposed yeah 100 percent hundred percent. Um, so just, just quickly, because I, I, um, and thanks so much for coming on. It's a, it's a really, uh, for a, for a corny dad joke, I'm, I'm getting my practice in. Um, it's a, it's a sobering conversation. Um, because it's just, um, like it's, it's something that I wish happened more and, but I've gone through a whole process of it. I must admit, and the listeners have heard it before and it's too long to explain, but um, yeah, like I, I just wish that we could stop, like we almost need to like lose the word like addiction, you know, because it's not that for everyone and just look at it. I love the continuum kind of way of thinking about it. That's how I think about it too, spectrum type thing. And you can land anywhere on that at any different time. Um, and it'd be good if we thought about alcohol consumption, like we did physical health, um, you know, don't go outside without a jumper on when it's cold, you know, maybe it's advisable not to have a drink if you're, 
having a tough time emotionally or mental health issues, or you're arguing with your partner or whatever it might be, um, you know, cause that increases your chance of something going wrong and you're moving down the continuum in that moment. So it's, it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great conversation and I wish it happened more. Um, and I, I really um, am down with the perspective, but have you found like through all the therapy and stuff that you've done, like I, I noticed, like, are you kind of a full-time writer at the moment and are you back in journalism do you focus mainly on sobriety stuff or do you venture into these other topics as well um so i am a speech writer uh oh, nice. with beyond blue at, at the moment yep. um so i do that a few days a week so i'm writing speeches for for their um senior team who are out there talking to the, the world about mental health. So that's a very privileged position to be in. Yeah. Um, and obviously I bring my own lived experience to that role, uh, which I think is important when we've got, you know, people talking to the public about mental health, it's really important that um, it's informed by people who have actually lived it, you know, who actually understand what it's like to be in that place. Um, I still write uh, for columns for the Guardian for the age. Um, I, will get to writing my fourth book at some point to figure out what that is but um yeah I, i'm very much still in the writing space i do a lot of my writing on instagram which sounds maybe a bit strange but i, I like to write in extended captions that that are hopefully you know try to capture a little bit of how people are feeling and and to try and make people feel less alone by sharing my own kind of vulnerabilities and mm. um my own sort of take on the world and particularly in the last year where it's just been so challenging for so many people um and i think like what you were saying before about mental health and alcohol it's just something i'm very passionate about something that i i'm trying to to do a lot of writing on is just to to really um i just don't think a lot of people really understand the link between your mental health and how much you drink like i just don't yeah. think it's really well understood to the point where almost the opposite is true you know we saw during lockdown that bottle shops were considered an essential service and never closed you know and and i thought that was really interesting um and then we saw a lot of really targeted marketing from the alcohol industry deliberately equating the stresses of of the pandemic and lockdown and, and using alcohol as a way to cope with that, which is just beyond irresponsible because we know that alcohol makes it harder to cope. Like, and I think what I talk about in high sobriety is that we think that alcohol takes the edge off, but the next morning those edges are sharper and they cut you deeper. And that's, that is the way that alcohol works is that it, it might momentarily relieve your stress, but it will rebound in a way that makes everything worse. So I think what you were saying about like, it would be great to have some education around, as you say, like, you know, it's, if you're feeling a certain way, don't reach for the bottle. <laughs> That's actually yeah. the worst thing you could do. Uh, and I don't know even if people really, I wrote a piece for Beyond Blue about um, anxiety, you know, like that hangover mm. anxiety that can be so crippling and debilitating and, and horrendous when you wake up and you're just filled with dread and shame and regret and you're, heart is racing and like there's actually a reason for that like there's a chemical yeah. storm happening in your body the morning after you drink because it's like the chemical imbalance there's two different um chemicals that are released when you drink and one you know excite one calms down the brain so that's why you kind of get drunk and want to like hug strangers and it because it relaxes you <laughs> but then the next morning your body is like this you've got too much of that so it then releases this other chemical which excites the brain and it's like an accelerator with the foot stuck on the, or with the foot stuck on the accelerator in a car where everything is just in, in overdrive and I don't think people really understand that 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 is a chemical response to the alcohol in your body and you don't necessarily have to have a pre-existing mental health issue to feel like shit mm. from the drinking so I'd love to see a bit more awareness of that because a lot of the time when I talk about these kind of things in a public setting people are just like oh, i had no idea I, I just thought there was something wrong with me when i woke up and felt like yeah you know just in this world of shame so i think it'd be great to see more of that and that's kind of that's kind of what i try to do in my writing is just share that 
share all the messy parts of ourselves because the only reason, well, not the only reason, but one of the most isolating things about mental ill health is feeling like you're the only one experiencing it. And mm. really we all go through it. And the more that we can talk about all those kind of messy, complex, difficult, challenging parts of ourselves that we keep hidden, the more connected we are and the less alone we feel. A hundred percent. Hey, well, I would just, uh, from a selfish point of view, encourage you to keep um, putting it out there, the writing, because it's, it's definitely come across my um, digital newspaper these days, the phone. Um, and yeah, I, I can see it having great impact on a lot of people. So thanks for putting it out there, mate. Hey, that's uh, Jill Stark, everybody. Um, heaps of books, heaps of stuff there. Where can people find you on social media? Uh, so they can go to uh, Jill Stark underscore underscore is my Instagram handle. We type in Jill Stark as you come up um, or they can follow me, Jill Stark on Facebook, on Twitter, um, on my website, jillstark.com.au. You can buy my books. You can, I, I have been doing pre COVID. I was doing some workshops uh, called warrior to warrior about how you turn your inner anxious brain into uh, a strong warrior and um just basically sharing my kind of the lessons i've learned from a lifetime of anxiety um so i'm hoping to do more of them so if anyone's keen to come along to one of those workshops they can sign up on my mailing list on my website and i'll let you know when when we're back on when um hopefully covid is not going to shut things down for too much longer. <laughs> love it come love and, it come and say hi on instagram and come to on no no Boost day tuesday the next one will be um well it's, it's the first tuesday of every month so first tuesday of every month awesome awesome yeah. we'll make sure that we put all of that in the show notes um and yeah hey thanks again for coming on and, and giving you your time really really appreciate it thanks everybody peace Hey YouTube watcher, thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you and your family are doing well in these extraordinary times. I also want to ask you, can you please subscribe and hit the bell notification? We're really launching into our YouTube channel this year and want to build our audience so that we can progress through the ranks and basically get the message of recovery and hope and change and all that good stuff out there to as many people as we can. So we would love it if you would consider it and subscribe and help us out. Also for anyone seeking help um, and information and resources, we've put together a 100% free online course that you can access, link in the description. Um, so if you are looking for help, hope that you know is something that can help you out as well. Um, until next time, see you in the next video. Peace.